Well, good morning, everybody. It's a blessing to be with you on the Lord's Day again, and good to uh, greet our visitors and our newcomers. We do extend to you a very warm welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and are thankful that you've joined us and look forward to getting to know you after, after our worship this morning. But as we turn uh, to the preaching of God's Word, I would ask you to turn with me again to Paul's epistle to the Philippians. Philippians, and we want to read this morning Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Let us stand for the reading of God's word. This is the word of God to his church. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please be seated. Let us seek the Lord's help one more time in prayer as we come to the preaching of his word. Let us unite our hearts and go to the Lord together. Our gracious Father, we do not have words, we cannot think of words to adequately describe the glories that are described in this passage, this description of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet his humility, his humiliation in emptying himself and making himself of no reputation to come to become a man for our sakes, to be our Redeemer and our Savior. Father, we pray that you would minister to the hearts of your people this morning. Lord, encourage our hearts, humble our hearts, as we think of the the lows and the depths to which Christ descended for our sakes, as we consider how he, though he was rich, became poor, so that we might become rich in Him. Lord, may it humble us. We pray that we would diminish, that we would decrease, that, Lord, we would think of ourselves as unworthy, that we would think of ourselves as those who it is fitting to be servants of one another rather than demanding to be kings who would be served. Lord, we pray that You would cause us to pour contempt on all of our pride, Thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for his perfect person and work. Lord, he is our only hope. It is on him that we cast ourselves. This king who humbled himself to the point of death and has now been exalted at your right hand as Lord of lords and King of kings, the one before whom all the nations will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. We cast ourselves upon him. We pray, Lord, that we would glory with delight at the blessing that it is to know Christ now. 
to know that we will not be those who bow unwillingly in the day of his power, but that you, by your grace, have softened our hearts, you have humbled our hearts over our sins and our helplessness, and you have caused us to cast ourselves, body and soul, in life and in death upon Christ alone. Father, glorify yourself. We pray that you would draw near to us now as your people. Build us up in our most holy faith. We pray, Lord, for any who are here who are strangers to your grace. Lord, we pray that you would convert them. We pray that you would strike them with the striking reality that Christ is Lord now and that we must bow before it is too late. Lord, be with us, we pray. We ask in Christ's name, amen. I have to admit right out the, uh, from the start of this that this sermon this morning has changed several times this week. Um, I intended at first to seek to cover this section in the entirety of its Christology, its, uh, the challenges that have been brought against it, the applications that Paul makes. And pretty soon I realized that's not going to happen, and so I thought I would just cover the Christology of it and deal with some of the applications. And lo and behold, once words start to add up, I realized I'm simply going to, this morning, cover its Christology and leave the other things for future sermons. And so we'll be parked here in Philippians 2, these first 11 verses, for a little bit, and that's good for us because I wanted to park here anyway because this is a wonderful passage to stop the car and to open up things like the person and work of Christ and his two natures as mediator and why those things are important. So we'll, we'll be here for a bit and I don't think that should discourage us because as you noticed even as we read, this section is like Paul spilled the rubies. And, and the nuggets of Christian truth and doctrine. And it's good for us to spend some time picking up as many as we can and examining as many as we can. This section, I'm going to be focusing on verses 5 through 11. This section has been called through the history of the church the Carmen Christi, the Christ hymn. And the reason for that being uh, because it's believed by many, and I'm sympathetic to this, that verses 6 through 11 are not Paul's original creation, meaning he's not the one who originally penned this hymn, but that he's rather quoting a well-known hymn that would have been sung by the early church, and he's using this as a sermon illustration to press home his exhortations to the congregation to walk in humility. Now, if that's true, and again, I have sympathies that it is, one thing that tells us is that the early church had some very, very rich hymns, didn't it? This is not, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, sung seven times. This is doctrinal, theological doxology of what God has done. It, hard, I don't know, maybe Hebrews 1, but... It, it's hard to find and think of a higher passage that speaks more wonderfully of the glorious person and work of Christ. Considering Christ in his pre-incarnate glory, his divine majesty, his equality with God, and then moving to consider his human humiliation in becoming a slave, and then considering his subsequent human glorification and exaltation to the right hand of God. Let me encourage us, brothers and sisters, it's important for pastors to equip their people for defenses of the faith, apologetics. This is, this is a passage that it's good to have in your back pocket for evangelism and to make sure you understand it and can explain it. Because you will hear people say, I promise you this, uh, especially Jehovah's Witnesses, it's one of the things that they're trained to challenge Christians on, People will come to you and they will tell you that doctrines like the Trinity, doctrines like the equality of the Son with the Father from eternity, they will tell you those are doctrines that were just made up by the church in 325 A.D. at the Council of, My of Nicaea. And I hope Philippians 2 shows you that that is simply not true. Because here in the first century, 
mere decades after Christ has ascended into heaven, you have the first century church singing of their Savior who is equal with God, who is in the form of God and yet humbled Himself in becoming a human to be the Savior of His people. So don't buy it when people tell you that you just believe a bunch of unbiblical, ecclesiastical philosophizing. Now, having said that, what's funny is that Paul's main purpose here in this passage is not to prove the pre-existence and the equality of the Son with the Father. Rather, that is simply assumed here. Um, he's simply citing what was clearly the accepted belief of the early church, and he's citing it to reinforce his practical exhortations that the church walk in humility. Let's think about that. Imagine that. How does a pastor press home the appropriateness, the fitness for Christians, those who name the name of Christ, to walk in a spirit of lowliness and humility and deference towards one another? You know, some, some pastors think that the only way you can get people to do that is by yelling at them and making them feel like, you know, dirt. That's not what Paul does. What does Paul do? He reminds them of the person and work of Christ. It's incredibly high doctrine for an incredibly low, practical, rubber-meets-the-road application. Now, I know I've already told you I'm leaving application for a future sermon, but I do want to just say at the, at the outset here, this passage has profound implications for all of your life. No matter who you are, uh, children, I told my children that I'd be talking to them for a little bit this morning. So I'm talking to all the children here. Children, how often do mom and dad tell you not to be selfish, but to think of the needs of others rather than insisting on your own way? Any of the little ones ever hear anything like that from their parents? Oh, come on. Come on, be honest. <laughs> have, have you ever struggled as, as a child to just want your own way? Right? I know you have. I have kids, and I was a kid, and I'm still in some senses a grown-up kid who has the same difficulties. Now, I want you to pay attention. Why should you be humble and be the servant of others? It's because Christ, who is God, came to serve us. Right? Very simple, guys. We'll do some catechism. Is Jesus God, guys, kids? Is Jesus God? Yes. yes. Is Jesus worthy of worship? Did Jesus deserve to be murdered on a cross for sins that he did not commit? No. no. But he willingly did it for love, to forgive us for our sins and to set an example for us. And therefore, what an unfitting thing it is, isn't it? When we sinners act like we're just kings and queens who deserve to be served, right? That's what Paul is getting at here. Uh, parents, church members, don't think that you're going to get off the hook here. Kids aren't the only ones who struggle with pride and self-serving, uh, self -serving, being self-serving. Parents, husbands, wives, uh, church members, do you ever have the slight impulse to think of yourself first? <laughs> uh, to to insist on what I deserve, right? And to think, how dare they not recognize me and not treat me like the gem that I am? Anyone have the slightest impulse to do that and think that way? If you say no to that, you're, being, you're a liar or you're self-deceived. There's the only, the only two options. Uh, it happens every day. This, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know that this is where the battle of the Christian life rages the hottest. That never-ending war of putting to death King Self, prideful Kyle, who thinks way more of himself than he should, the battle to put to death Self and to enthrone King Jesus, who though he was God, came to become a slave to save a wretch like me. And who came to become a slave to save a wretch like you. And so the logic of the Christian life, the logic that Paul is putting forth here, is if Jesus became a servant, a slave, to save me and to save you, who am I to think that I am above serving you? Brothers and sisters, you know this. The closer you walk with Christ, the, the more 
intimately acquainted you get with Christ, the more you love Christ, in equal, to, in equal proportion to that, you begin to pour contempt on all of your pride. As you realize just how much sin has miscalibrated our hearts and how much we need the grace of God to recalibrate them, to live for the glory of God as we ought to. So that's your application. We'll pick that up in a week or a couple weeks. Take that and hold that in your mind as we go through the passage this morning. Think about your attitude towards your husband, towards your wife, towards your kids, towards your parents, towards your brother or sister in the church who you think is weird and who believes weird things, and therefore you find it hard to serve them. Bring those attitudes before Christ in this passage and see if he does not shed convicting light upon your heart. What I want to do this morning is I want to keep it simple. And I say that in a bit of quotes because we're dealing with a hypostatic union and the two natures of Christ in one person. And so I will keep it as simple as I can while seeking to understand Paul. But what I mean by that is I want to just deal with the passage as we have it for the most part. A lot of times when we come to Philippians 2 and other passages like these, John 1, we come at them more from a defensive posture where we're defending against error about what it doesn't mean. And I think that's important and we will do that um, for the instruction of our people. And I'll even mention a few of those this morning just briefly. But that's not the first intention of the passage. The first intention of the passage is that these Christians who already knew this would bask in what is said about the glory of Christ and the humility of Christ and the exaltation of Christ so that that would sink down into their hearts and change them into humble servants of one another. So as I said, I want to focus on verses 5 through 11. If you look at verse 5, he says, it's a command, let this mind be in you which also was in Christ Jesus. Or if you have an ESV, which is also yours in Christ Jesus. It's, uh, there's ambiguity in the Greek. It could go either way. The word mind here means attitude. Have this attitude, this purpose, this disposition among you. He's calling for Christians to have a Christian mindset. Now, what is a Christian mindset? It is one that reflects Christ himself. And then Paul launches into this Glorious passage. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, verse 6, who, being in the form of God, or existing in the form of God. What, what a place to start. And this is where you must start. If we are going to understand the depths of his humility, you must start by understanding his intrinsic worth and honor who being in the form of God. By the way, brothers and sisters, that means exactly what it sounds like it means. It means like what Paul says in Romans 9, 5, that Christ is God forever blessed forevermore. It means what John says in John 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And so there's distinction between the Son and the Father in terms of person But then John says, and the Word was God. Sharing and possessing the the identical, numerically one divine essence with the Father. Now, some of you might have Jehovah's Witnesses friends, uh, or they come to your door, or you see them in coffee shops. The Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that all that means, when Paul says he was in the form of God, all that means is that Jesus was in the form of God in the sense that God is a spirit and Jesus was an angelic spiritual being. I I don't know if you know this, some of you do. They believe that Michael the archangel became Jesus and then subsequently went back to being Michael the archangel. Now that won't work. First of all, it won't work because there's nowhere in the scripture that you can't, without doing horrible exegesis, arrive at that conclusion. But secondly, it won't work because I'll show you right here in this passage. Notice how Paul uses this word form. Okay, he uses it twice in this passage. Once in verse 6 and once in verse 7. And notice how he uses it in verse 7. Speaking of Christ becoming human, he says he took the what? 
form of a servant being made in the likeness of men. So think about it. If taking the form of a servant means taking the form of a man, then what must being in the form of God mean? That he's an angel? <laughs> um, by the way, are angels servants anyway? <laughs> uh, th it, this wouldn't be humility for one type of servant to simply become another type of servant. That totally destroys Paul's meaning here. Paul's point is this is the one, the one we are speaking of, Christ. This is the one who eternally existed in the category of worthy to be served, entering into a form to be a servant. This is very God of very God, equal with the Father in glory and power and majesty and holiness and sovereignty. This is what Christianity is built upon. If you're here and you're not a Christian, I hope you understand this. Every other religion made up by men works around the premise, what can I do to appease the deity? Christianity says the deity himself comes down to do for me what I could not do to save myself. Christianity is founded that this one who died is the same one who prayed in John 17, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began. The one who becomes flesh, who becomes frail, is the one who had eternal glory with the Father. Notice he goes, Paul goes further. Verse 6. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, I know if you have the ESV, and I know many of you follow along in the ESV, it's worded a bit differently. But I personally, I've always held this position, and I tend to agree, agree more with the older commentators here. I personally think the word robbery is helpful here, that he considered it not robbery to be equal with God. Because think about it. What are you doing when you rob someone? You are taking something that doesn't rightfully belong to you, right? That's what you're doing when you commit robbery. And Paul here says, when Christ considered his equality with God, what did he think? Did he think, oh no, I'm an unworthy servant? I'm just a spirit being? Uh, I'm, I'm far below the majesty of the true God? No, Paul says he considered it not robbery to be equal with God. To borrow Matthew Henry's language, he did not... He was not invading on the space of another and taking rights that he had no right to take. Now just step back and think about it for a moment. This statement is absolute, utter blasphemy if Christ is anything less than God. And, and the rest of the scriptures prove that for us. Uh, what did Paul do? You remember Acts 14? They start bowing down and worshiping Paul, start calling him Zeus and things like this. Do you remember what Paul did when they started doing that? He tears his clothes. And he said, you must not do that. We are like men, like you, with like passions like you. And we came to preach the gospel that you would turn away from these things and worship the true and the living God. You remember the angel in Revelation, right? What does John do? John is so overcome with the glory of the angel that he bows down to worship him. And what does the angel say to John? He says, you must not do that. Worship God. No creature, absolutely no creature ever deserves the attribution of divinity. And if it is given to them, it is robbery of the utmost severity. It is to rob God and yet of Christ it is said, in Hebrews 1, and we could go all over the place elsewhere. The Father says to the Son in Hebrews 1, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then the Father says, Let all God's angels worship Him. That would be idolatry and blasphemy if Christ were not God. And that's where the amazing descent begins. The amazing descent. This one, though equal with God, and therefore having all the rights and the privileges of deity, Paul writes this amazing line, this one 
emptied himself. New King James has made himself of no reputation. That's a, I believe that's a good um, explanation, but that's somewhat of a loose translation. Literally, it is he emptied himself. Now, I told you I would keep it simple, but I didn't promise you that I would keep you from having to think about grammar here. Okay, Grammar matters. Look at the text. The verb empty here is the main, what we call the finite verb of the sentence. It's the main verb. And then this emptying is explained in what are called two participial phrases. Okay, now if you have no idea what that means, it doesn't matter. I'll break it down in layman's terms. What that means is that the two statements that come after the verb, he emptied himself, are what explain what emptying means. Okay, so what are those two phrases? Taking the form of a slave and coming in the likeness of men. Now, it's very paradoxical language, if if you think about it. But theologically, it's important. Notice, Paul says he empties himself by taking something. Right? You, You see that? That's the word Paul uses. Now, usually when you take something, you get what? Richer. You get fuller. If I have $2 and I take $5 from you, I have more dollars than I had. Right? But what's going on here in the the incarnation, Christ taking humanity to himself, is I think, I could be wrongly attributing this to Bavink, but I believe it was him, that what's going on in the incarnation is subtraction by addition. Augustine put it this way. He emptied himself not by changing his own divinity, but by assuming our changeableness. In other words... The self-emptying of the Son is accomplished by Him adding to Himself finite, frail humanity. Now, we'll deal, this is one of those things that we'll deal probably more in depth in a later sermon, but I'll just, I'll say a word about it here. There is something that's become known, uh, come to be known as the kenotic theory. Has anyone ever heard of kenosis, kenotic theory? Some of us have. And that's taken from the Greek word here for the word empty, uh, ekenosin, so kenotic, you can hear it. Um, And this view has said that when Christ emptied himself, it means he emptied himself of at least part of his divinity, of his attributes, something of his divine nature. Now let me just say very clearly, that is a major serious error. Number one, God cannot change, right? God is immutable. He He cannot cease to be who he is. And so if Christ in any way, according to divinity, ceased to be what he was, Christ cannot be God because God is unchanging. You remember Jesus in John 8, speaking to the Jews, says, before Abraham was, what? I am. Not I was. God is not the one who simply was as if he's becoming or who will be. He simply is the great I am. And so is Jesus in the flesh. And one of the biggest reasons that that, I'll just say this, one of the biggest reasons that becomes important is because if Christ ceased to be divine in any sense or any extent, that would make the atonement a virtual impossibility. Because divine wrath needs a divine sacrifice. Human, yes, but upheld by divinity. And you can read, um, oh, I'm not going to be able to think of the catechism. Not the canons of the door. What's the catechism? Heidelberg, yeah. Read Heidelberg, question 17. Thank you. That's what happens when you go off your notes. Answer 17, to the question number 17 deals with that in detail. Um, when Christ empties himself, okay, when Paul speaks of this emptying, there is absolutely no change in the divine essence, Okay? Divinity is not morphing into humanity. It's not mixing with humanity and creating some third different thing, some lesser thing. Rather, the Son is assuming, uh, is assuming, in addition to his divine nature, a complete human nature. And with that nature, he is assuming all the status of a creature. And that is a supreme act of humility. To willingly empty himself of all privileges and rights as he comes to be a slave. Think That's how it should be translated. It's doulos. It's the word for slave. 
That's a shocking statement that God should become a slave. You think of the Roman Empire. What was a slave? It was one who had no rights, no freedoms. It was one who did not live to themselves and for themselves, but lived to serve the needs of others. Now, guys, let's pause for a second. Have we grown too comfortable and too familiar with the shocking truth, as Wesley put it, our God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. Think of the condescension. That's the point here, right? That's what he's driving at. Guys, be humble because Christ your Savior was humble. Think of the condescension. That he who flung the stars into existence by his fingers, according to Psalm 8, verse 3, that he who knows all of the stars by name, he who, Hebrews 1, 3, I believe it is, upholds the universe by the word of his power, the one who infinitely has always been above and distinct from his creation, stoops and enters his creation as one of us. Like us in every respect with the exception of sin. Not only in constitution, body and soul, but in experience. Do you realize what that means? He who never knew hunger, who never knew fatigue, suddenly becomes hungry and tired. He who is the fountain of life and the cause of all things suddenly becomes dependent man. He who is king doesn't come as a king. And though he is Lord of lords, he comes as a servant. He who is of purer eyes than to behold evil comes in his humanity to be tempted and to do battle to conquer the enemy of our souls. Notice Paul says, very important, he became obedient. He became obedient. There's another debate. And as I'm preaching this, I'm realizing I told you I wouldn't talk about this too much, and I'm mentioning too many of them. But I'll say it here anyway. Um, we can delve into it more deeply. There's another debate that has been hotly swirling. The last, it's been almost a decade now, I think, regarding what's called the eternal functional subordination of the sun. Some of you have heard of that. EFS or EFSS is the abbreviation. And they assert that the Son's obedience to the Father is not just something that refers to His incarnation as mediator, but that it is an eternal subordination to the Father. That's not what Paul says here. He says He became obedient. Becoming obedient, like a servant, like a slave, is an aspect of the Son's humiliation as mediator. The Son, considered in Himself, is one with the Father, equal in authority, equal in power, sharing the one divine will. But as mediator, the God-man, He enters into this position of subjection and obedience. That should humble us. The very God of very God becomes submissive, becomes obedient. That, that's why we hear and read words like we do in the Garden of Gethsemane. When the Son is, is crying out in prayer to His Father, Father, not my will, but Your will be done. That, that's His human, the will of His human nature wrestling. And the Savior is growing through learning obedience, as Hebrews talks about, as He suffers. We saw it in Galatians. He was born under the law. He was sent forth to do the work that the Father has given Him to do. And brothers and sisters, that mission that the Father sent Him on, not that He did not do it willingly, but it was an exceedingly difficult mission. His mission of obedience was not a walk in the park. It was not easy obedience. It required of the Son His all. Learning and growing and maturing as the second Adam. Being rejected by sinners. Being hated. Being persecuted. Being blasphemed. 
tempted, cursed, all of which was preparing him for the greatest act of obedience he would perform, the laying down his life as the Lamb of God for the eternal redemption of his people. Notice what Paul says. He, having become obedient, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Of the cross. Brothers, I really believe if we had been there and we had seen Calvary with our own eyes, we would speak of the cross with utmost reverence. We in our culture have domesticated the cross. People wear it. It's depicted in art. It's on Bibles. It's on churches. We never even give it a second thought. The cross to the first century person was almost a curse word not to be spoken of. It was the most horrendous, humiliating, excruciating instrument of death the sinful minds of the Roman Empire could come up with. In which prisoners, enemies of the state, naked often and bloodied and beaten, slowly perish as a spectacle before men. Reserved for traitors. Reserved for the worst of criminals. That's why Paul speaks, 1 Corinthians, of the foolishness of the cross. The cross is foolishness when you realize what it really is. The cross for Paul was a spectacle, but it was not merely a spectacle for men. It represents more than simply the cruelty of men. According to Paul, what was happening in the cross, Romans chapter 3, is that God the Father was putting his son forward as a public spectacle to demonstrate his righteousness. Demonstrating publicly that his salvation of sinners comes at the cost of the death of the Son of God. Galatians 3, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Brothers, think about it. Cursed of God is the one who hung upon the cross of Calvary. He who was in the form of God became cursed of God for you. And then we turn around and we give our wife the silent treatment because she didn't do what I wanted her to do. Or we tell our kids to be quiet and we get angry with them because I need me time. The cross is where the Son of God, being in the form of God, becoming man, offers himself as the bleeding sacrifice for my eternal salvation. The Son crying out, Think of humility. The son crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we, as his people, get to turn around and cry, my God, my God, why do you love me? Why are you so patient with me? Even though I have this thorn that will not die, this pride that continues to rear its ugly head, Why am I so prone to make myself king when my king died for me? You see how low Christ went. Utterly broken. Exchanging his riches for rags to become poor for us. He became dead for us. The immortal dies. That's enough to cause us. We, We could stop here and commit ourselves to God's grace. We'll pick more of that up in coming weeks. But that's not the end here. We'll finish out where Paul finishes out this hymn. This is the great turn. And Paul wants them to hear this side as well as an encouragement for their own incentive to humility. How often do we read things in the Bible like humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will what? Exalt you. Christ is the supreme example The Father will not let the obedience and the sufferings of His Son go unrewarded. But after His death and His burial, 
which was marked the end of his humiliation, the father then declares the triumph of his son, beginning with the resurrection. The resurrection, to say it was a new day, is an understatement. The, the resurrection is when hell has been destroyed, uh, the enemy of our souls has been put down, death has been killed, and Christ walks out of the grave, the God-man who has conquered. And then it continues in his ascension and his heavenly, se heavenly session, and I think that's what Paul probably has in mind here. Notice what Paul says, therefore, that's a big therefore, in light of everything he's just said, the son's humiliation, because of his perfect obedience even unto death, the Father has highly exalted him. Literally, hyper-exalted him. Exalted him to the highest place. Now, I for one, and I know we're supposed to be content with you know, God's lot for us and where he chooses to place us in redemptive history and things like that. But if there is any such thing as a holy envy, I for one wish I could have been one who was already in heaven when this exaltation took place, to see this great day. <laughs> this exaltation, notice the tense, is something that has already happened. He doesn't say God will exalt him. He says he has exalted him. And as I say, it begins with the resurrection, but it then proceeds to his ascension into heaven and his heavenly session at the right hand of God in heaven. And brothers and sisters, you realize there were saints and angels who were there that day. <laughs> Abraham was there. David was there. The thief on the cross was there. We, we sung in one of our hymns this morning that just as the thief saw that fountain in, in his day, that says, that's why he was, while he was still alive. But you realize he also, some, I don't know, what, 40 days later or something? How, 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 I'm forgetting my time period. He's in heaven and he gets to see the return of the king in glory. <laughs> I don't know how heaven will work. That's my point of m mentioning this. That there are many things that are mysterious. But I hope and I really hope that somehow we will be able to rewatch that. Maybe it will be that the saints retell the story to us. But for now we get to, with our informed minds biblically and with our sanctified imaginations, we get to believe it and we even get to sing of it like we did this morning. I say that this is my, or one of my favorite hymns way too often, so I'm not going to say that. It's starting to lose its, it doesn't mean anything anymore if every hymn is your favorite hymn. But I do really like this hymn, Look Ye Saints, the Sight is Glorious. Look Ye Saints, the Sight is Glorious. You know what that is? That the setting of that hymn is not saints on earth, it's saints in heaven. And that is one saint in heaven getting a glimpse of the returning king as he's ascending from earth into heaven and he's saying to the others, look ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the what? The man of sorrows now. He's no longer a man of sorrows. From the fight returned victorious, every knee to him shall bow. The fourth stanza. Hark those bursts of acclamation. Let heaven burst. Hark those loud triumphant chords. As Jesus takes the highest station, oh, what joy the sight affords. And the refrain, crown him, crown him, King of kings and Lord of lords. Brothers, sisters, do you ever think about the triumphant celebration that took place in heaven? when Jesus comes back and takes his seat on the throne of God. As the Father gives to his Son the highest station and the saints cry out one after another, crown him and crown him again as they throw their crowns at his feet. This exaltation of Christ, which properly in a technical sense, properly refers to, to the exaltation of his humanity because his divinity could not be exalted any higher than it already had been. This is the Father's bestowal upon Christ the mediator of ultimate power and honor. That's how you summarize these last verses. Power and honor is given to the Son. 
It, it is the restoration of all of the rights and privileges that he willingly emptied himself of. And what a joy for the saints to ponder. This is what Paul wants to, and we'll get to this in our application at a later time, but this is what he wants to press upon these Christians, that he who will be, or he who is first will be last, and that he who is last will be first. Right? Guys, the way up is the way down. That he who would be great must be the servant of all. First of all, notice the honor that is bestowed on him when he's given the name that is above every name. Now that doesn't mean, I hope, I assume we know this, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden the father gave him a totally different name by which he's being addressed as. Like now his name's Jeff. That's not the point here. Being given the name above every name what that means is that the name I believe is Lord. And what is happening here is that while it's true, he has been recognized as Lord before in his humiliation by his saints. What is happening in his exaltation is that what was concealed, what was cloaked in his humiliation as this man from Nazareth walked the earth in obscurity, as Isaiah says, having no beauty that we should look on him, suddenly this one is declared openly and publicly in heaven by the Father to be the Lord before whom all the nations will bow. It's a declaration of honor and place and authority. As Sproul said, when, when we hear the name Jesus... Our impulse immediately should be to bow down and ascribe all glory to him as Lord. Redounding to the glory of the Father. And just as that is a joy to the believer, it's also an incentive to the unbeliever to be made right with God. I want to close this morning by speaking to the unbeliever. There are some of you probably this morning who do not reverence the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In your hearts and in your life, you do not bow down. You take the name of the Lord Jesus Christ upon your lips as a curse word. And you speak in vanity about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you need to know and hear that that is a name above all other names which the Father esteems with infinite esteem and he will not hold them guiltless who do not repent and confess the Lordship of Christ. To regard the Son of God as anything less than Lord of Lords and King of Kings, anything less than divine Savior, the God-Man, is, according to Psalm 2, to set yourself in opposition against the Lord and against His anointed. And the Father is infuriated with all who would mock His Son. That's His Son. His perfect, obedient, holy Son who is the express image of the Father and whom the Father has exalted above every rule and authority. And you either exalt Him in your heart of hearts now by faith and you receive the blessed gift of the forgiveness of sins and peace with God by bowing the knee willingly to this merciful, gracious mediator and Savior or you will one day bow in the day of his power, teeth gnashing, and you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and to your own destruction. And how so many on that day will look back on days like this when they sat in church under the preaching of the gospel and Christ was pressed on them Christ was presented to them as one who will not reject you but will receive you now if you will but come with empty hands 
and humble faith and cling to him for righteousness with God. And how that will agonize the tormented soul in hell to know that they spurned the free offer of mercy. This is the power that he has received. Not only honor, but power. Notice what he says, Paul. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Listen to me very, very carefully. If you're here and you're an unbeliever, and I'm being, I'm being serious with you right now because this is serious. And because Christ has been so domesticated by unfaithful preachers that they make people feel like there's no urgency to come to Christ or not come to Christ. You may have heard of a Jesus from other pulpits that makes you feel like you're in the driver's seat and you're the one who's calling the shots and that Jesus is just a poor, lonely Savior who is just waiting and begging for you to come to his party to validate his authority by making him the Lord of your life. And you think that whether I come or whether I don't come, there's no great consequence. You need to know the gospel invitation is not make Jesus the Lord of your life. Because the Father has already made him Lord. He is king. We don't make him anything. The call of the gospel is sinner. He is king and he is Lord. And you need to lay down your foolish arms of rebellion because there's danger. He's a, he's a merciful king right now for all who come to him in faith. But there is coming a day that for all who refuse to bow the knee, he will break them with a rod of iron. And so sinner, I plead with you, come to Christ. Recognize and submit yourself to his authority as Lord of Lords. Bow the knee and kiss the Son. Flee the anger of His wrath. For the one who has died in weakness has risen to reign. And He will reign forevermore. Receive now the mercies of His humiliation and the glories of His exaltation. Brothers and sisters, this is our Christ. This is the one whom we worship. And he is enough to keep us busy for a lifetime and an eternity. And he will. Paul calls for an attitude that is consistent with this mind which was in Christ. I promise you, there is absolutely nothing you traffic in or experience that comes anywhere close to the humility that the Lord Jesus Christ subjected himself to. And so, brother, sister, let us walk humbly. Let us slay pride. Let us take up the role of a servant and let God exalt us, not ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you'd give us humble hearts. Lord, cause us not to just mimic words and say phrases that we think we ought to say, but help us to feel in our hearts how unworthy we are of Christ's condescension. Help us to feel how contemptible our pride is when we fight and bicker and get revenge because we think of ourselves as kings and we think of others as servants Lord, we simply cannot, we cannot sustain that kind of mindset when we truly come to know and study and grow to love the Lord Jesus in all of his humility. Lord, we confess it is a contradiction in our lives, one in which we are thankful for your forgiveness and one for which we pray for your grace to continue to cut away the remaining seeds of pride that so often rise up in our hearts and in our words, the way we relate to others, the way we 
take vengeance into our own hands, the way we ignore others. Father, help us to grow in this mind which was in Christ. Help us to consider ourselves the least of all the saints. Lord, that we would consider ourselves as wholly unworthy of such a gospel. And yet you have given Christ and your spirit has given us faith in him. Help us, Lord, to imitate him by your grace. We pray, Father, that you would be with us, draw near to us as we come to the table. Help us to ponder the humility and the exaltation of our Lord, the glories of our Lord, the sufficiency. He has taken the highest station. He is presently king. He is presently Lord. He will protect his people. He will see us to glory. He intercedes for us. Father, encourage our hearts. Replace doubt with faith. Lord, cause us to be steadfast in an assurance of your eternal love to us in giving your Son to die for us and Christ's eternal love in giving himself for us. Father, draw near to us, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.